Okay, go ahead, Chuck. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this regularly scheduled meeting of the Board of Education. Tonight is Tuesday, September 22nd, 2020. It is 7.02 p.m. and we are holding this meeting in accordance with the governor's executive order. Ellen, can we take roll call, please? Yes, thank you, Mr. Carey. Good evening, everyone. Mr. Cassio? He's, he's on, he's connecting. Mrs. Evans? Here. Mrs. Granado? Present. Mr. Lesser? Here. Mr. Michaels? Here. Mrs. Paradise? She's here. Yeah. She's probably unmuting. Um, Mr. Riley? Sorry. Sorry. No problem. Mr. Riley? Here. Mr. Healy? Here. Chairperson Mr. Carey? Present. All present. Thank you. Moving on to the Pledge of Allegiance. Mr. Emmett, can you lead us in the pledge, please? Certainly. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. America. And to the republic for which it stands. One nation, one nation under God, under God invisible, invisible, invisible just, liberty, liberty, and justice, justice, justice for all. For all. Thank you. Moving on to the approval of minutes. Mr. Michaels, I believe you have a motion. Yes, I move that we uh, accept the September 8th, 2020 regular Board of Education meeting minutes. Second. Third, thank you. Um, are uh, there can I have some corrections? You? Yes, here we go. I just have some corrections, some additions um, under board comment. Uh, indicating number 10 board comment with the conversation um, right before in terms of fall football the question that I asked regarding was not only fall football was the future of all sporting programs so we don't give the children false hopes so noted any other comments corrections Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention, motion passes. Abstain. Thank you. Abstain. So noted. I should let people get off mute. Sorry, Ms. Evans. It's all right. Okay, public comment. Mr. Emmett, I, there's no emails. Last time I checked, anyone on the call? On the call? Uh, there is no one in the queue. All right, moving on from public comment. Communications, Mr. Emmett. Thank you, Mr. Terry. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Jen Hoffman uh, to the meeting this evening. Jen is uh, working with me as uh, an administrative intern. Uh, Jen is uh, working on her 093 certificate with Central Connecticut State University. Uh, she is currently Director of Special Services for the Hartford Public Schools and uh, has worked with me over the course of the summer and will do so into the fall on learning about the ins and outs of the superintendency. So Jen, welcome, glad you're here. You. Uh, have some good news to start off with this evening. I'm very pleased to announce that Weathersfield High School senior, Mr. Tiago Wynn has been elected as the Board of Education student representative. Tiago will join us for the October 13th board meeting. And I certainly look forward to working with Tiago and appreciate the leadership that he will bring to our uh, board as the student rep. Um, he is a, an avid cross-country runner. He has been uh, participating in cross-country and track for the past four years of his high school career. In his free time, he enjoys spending time with his family, gardening, investing in stocks. Perhaps he should be at one of our finance and uh, operations committee meetings. Uh, and also disassembling and reassembling his car to better understand how it works. After high school, Tiago plans on attending college with a major in business or political science. Uh, he reports he's honored to be able to represent the high school and student body at the Board of Education. So Tiago will join us for the next uh, regularly scheduled Board of Ed meeting. Uh, I have a COVID-19 update. As you are all aware, uh, our school community received word of a positive case last Wednesday afternoon. 
Uh, this evening, later on in the agenda, I have uh, asked Chloe Bobrowski, the district's nursing supervisor and COVID-19 co-liaison to join us to provide an update on our health protocols as we operate the district. I wanna talk a little bit about the uh, current status of the hybrid model. Um, as you know, we are currently operating in the hybrid model. We are prepared uh, and planned out for the hybrid through October at this point in time. I will tell you that I uh, meet on a regular basis with the Central Connecticut Health District. Um, and one of the things in talking with Charles yesterday is Charles has seen an uptick in the positivity rate and Charles recommends us waiting a few additional weeks before we look at a transition toward a more full-time approach. Again, the key piece here is understanding that we all wanna get the students back full-time. That's our ultimate goal. We also have to recognize the potential implications of a full reopening, including the inability to socially distance a minimum of six feet, increased numbers of students and staff that must quarantine in the event of a positive case, and the potential impact of having to go full remote should we be unable to staff classrooms during quarantine or isolation for a positive case. I do wanna recognize a couple of factors that we've done exceptionally well on thus far and will support us reopening more fully. First, mask compliance has been exceptional within all of our school buildings. Um, we did have to send out a reminder to our athletic teams about reminding them to make sure they're wearing their masks when they're finished with workouts. Um, but in the buildings, our students have been excellent in adhering to mask compliance. Second, we have seen our students and staff who are not feeling well have stayed home. This reduces the number of cases that end up in the isolation room and potentially the number of cases that are deemed to be positive or uh, that result in quarantine. And finally, I have to say, parents have been very responsive if they feel their children may have been exposed. Their outreach to our nurses and our principals has been exceptional. This allows us to immediately assess and prepare for contact tracing should the student ultimately test positive. So let's keep up the good work on, on those ends and let's again, continue to be patient as we move closer to a full reopening. Again, I wanna be patient. One of the things that we deal with frequently is we hear about what other districts are doing. We have to make sure that we recognize the fact that other districts have other capacity, whether it be larger classrooms, uh, we may have districts that have had a larger percentage of their students stay home with full remote. As of last week, the data continues to show we have 85% of our families in on the hybrid model and approximately 15% that have done full remote. So even with the positive case that has not skewed the number, <coughs> pretty consistent. We'll continue to report out. Uh, Chloe will have a lot more about contact tracing and what constitutes close contact. Uh, a little bit later on uh, this evening. I want to talk a little bit also about fall sports. Uh, this week, fall sports move forward into full practices with the intent of beginning competitive play on October 1st. Athletic Director Maltesi is currently working on a spectator plan that is going to significantly limit the number of spectators that may attend athletic events in order to stay in compliance with current state guidelines. I will tell you that there were some superintendents that were um, really adamant about not having any spectators at all. We're not trying to go to that extreme, but we must strike a balance. The district will not be allowing spectators from other visiting schools to attend. We are going to focus primarily on our parents of our athletes being able to attend these events. That keeps us in compliance allows parents to see their kids participate, and also allows us to continue social distancing. This practice is going to be applied consistently among Hartford area districts, so Weathersfield fans will not be admitted to away events. This practice will allow us to avoid having to eliminate all spectators from events. Mr. Maltesi will have additional information on fall events, as well as how we will hand or, handle our senior night activities coming out tomorrow. I do wanna talk about football because that has been an ongoing saga. Um, after a summer full of wavering and indecision, the CIAC announced that it would not support full contact 11 v 11 football for the fall. 
the CIAC did offer a couple of options for moderate impact football experiences, including a lineman challenge, as well as a 7v7 game with limited contact, uh, one hand touch, as it's noted. I did follow up with Health Director uh, Brown regarding participation in a non-CIAC sanctioned club football program. And let me be clear on this one. He did not support student participation in a club sport given the guidance received from the Department of Public Health. The CIAC did not close the door on a spring football season. If the metrics support it, we will certainly work to try and make that a reality. In the meantime, Mr. Maltesi will work with the coaching staff and the area athletic directors to explore the moderate risk options. In the meantime, also the football team will continue to practice within the current DPH guidelines. And with that, that's communications. Thank you, Mr. Emmett. Moving on to action items. Mr. Riley, do you have a motion for us? I make a motion to approve uh, motion two. Move that the Wethersfield Board of Education approve an unpaid leave of absence for ID 906520 under the provisions of Article 11, Section E of the current agreement between the Wethersfield Board of Education and the CSEA SEIU Local 2001, which extends the 30 days of leave previously approved by the superintendent's authority. This request is for extended leave beginning on October 5th, 2020 and continuing through November 6, 2020 of the 2020-2021 school year. Thank you, a second? I'll second. Thank you, Mr. Lesser. Mr. Emmett, any background or discussion? Yeah, with regard to this one, Mr. Carey, um, this is a, an employee that had already requested uh, 30 days leave, um, which was approved by me. This is an extension beyond 30 days, which must come before you, uh, the board. Uh, we support this. Uh, this is an unpaid leave, so it will not have a significant impact on the budget. Um, and I um, ask that you consider uh, approving this leave. Thank my, you. My I have a question. Well, is this a um, I don't know if you can reveal anything more, but will this position, is this position needed to be filled? Let's just say it's a media specialist. I have no idea what it is, but do you need to fill it? Yes, it is. Yes. You, you, so you need to fill it with a full-time sub? Yes, which we have. Okay. Just yes. curious. If, okay. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. So this, the position's already filled because the person's been out already, correct? Okay. Thanks, Chuck. Yeah. Just want to clarify. Thank Any you. Any other questions? Okay, seeing none, with a motion on the table, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion passes, thank you. Mr. Riley, I believe you have another motion for us. Make a motion to approve recommended motion 2A. Move that the Wethersfield Board of Education approve an unpaid leave of absence for ID 905406, which extends the 30 days of leave previously approved by the superintendent's authority. This request is for extended leave beginning on October 5th, 2020 and continuing through November 6th, 2020 of the 2020-2021 school year. Thank you, is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Emmett. Uh, this is the same scenario as the previous leave, Mr. Carey, one that uh, we support. Thank you, any questions? Yeah, I, I have one question. It's about both of those. Um, are we allowed to know if it's a COVID related reason or that's not, they just don't have the right to have the year without pay? Yeah, just, this is a yeah HIPAA, HIPAA protects that. That's correct. Any other questions? Seeing none, a motion on the table. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention, motion passes, thank you. Moving on to discussion items, Mr. Emmett. Yes, thank you, Mr. Carey. Uh, I am very pleased to have with us this evening, uh, Chloe Bobrowski. Um, Chloe is the district nursing supervisor uh, for the Wethersfield Public Schools. She has been an integral part of the whole reopening process. Um, she is our resident expert on all things COVID. 
Um, one of the things that we've done this year in an effort to make sure that her expertise is able to be shared across all buildings, um, typically she's housed over at Webb. So one of the things we've done is we brought in a substitute nurse at Webb so that we can make CLO district level so that she can get to all buildings and she can support staff members when we're dealing with a case involving isolation or any type of contact tracing. Uh, CLO also serves on a state committee. She's one of only, I believe, six nurses in the entire state of Connecticut, school nurses that was selected to serve on this committee and was really instrumental in being able to be the bridge between the Department of Public Health, the uh, State Department of Education, as well as the Weathersfield Public Schools. So at this time, uh, I'd like to turn it over to Chloe for an update on our health protocols. Chloe. Cool. Thank you very much. And thank you all for having me here tonight. It's nice to see you. Um, I do wish it, were, uh, it was Dr. Lynn Sosa that was sitting in this seat tonight to be able to address the board but I will do my best. Uh, we've been checking in regularly with the Department of Public Health and the Department of Education on Healthy Tuesdays to get frequent updates, review of the addendums that are coming out regularly. There was a new one even yesterday. I think it's addendum 14. So uh, we're, things are constantly changing and we're constantly trying to stay updated on the most recent information and be able to provide the most up-to-date guidance to our school system. Um, so with that, I just wanna let you know that we have had um, a previous relationship with the department, with our local health department. Our nurses have worked regularly with uh, Central Connecticut Health Department, whether it would be regarding lead abatement, bed bug stories, those types of things where we've actually had, we did have an established relationship with Charles Brown and Ann Hartman and other officials with the health district so that when we had to move into COVID tracing, it was a very uh, uh, natural relationship, one that I was happy to have already established so that we could proceed and work together because that is the one thing that this is about. We are all, definitely all in this together. So with that, when we opened up, when we started really working on our framework for reopening schools, and the health and safety for the operations of the schools and the staff and the students. We relied heavily on his expertise and his guidance in order for us to create the best possible environment for schools. So um, I just wanted to review that uh, we do have, you've heard about the three W's, wash your hands, wash, watch your distance um, and wear your mask but there's actually five W's and maybe even six, which include when you're sick, stay home. And when the health department calls, answer your phone because that's the reality of the days that we're living in right now. So being able to open up the schools, we started out communicating with the staff and provide resources for teachers and their students about uh, signs and symptoms of COVID. So on the very first day, um, August 24th of professional development, we had created over the summer a curriculum um, with curriculum specialists and the nurses that was three hours that we went, started at eight o'clock on Monday morning in order to really review the signs and symptoms of COVID-19 with all staff and let them know the different mitigating strategies that we all had had, we were, go we were going to put into place with the schools. So of course these included, you know, recognizing the signs and symptoms of COVID-19, um, what, what is social distancing, using the six feet rule, frequent hand washing, mask guidance. Um, we've since updated our framework to um, just recently with the recommendation from the Department of Pub Public Health, we banned the one-way valve masks. So if we do see a student that has come, with, come into the schools, we're able to, um, change out that mask, let the parent know that they're no longer allowed in schools. Um, they can, we let them keep them, they can wear them. They're not recommended to wear anywhere, but we definitely wanted to get them out of our school system. Um, uh, talked about our improved ventilation, talked about our enhanced cleaning. We reviewed PPE, um, the different types of mask coverings, the use of face shields, reinforcing the message that Face shields are not to be used alone. They're supposed to be used with a mask. Want to make sure everybody understood that. 
um, being able to go outside, being able to open a window if, if possible for better air exchange, coughing etiquette, and also reporting illnesses, which is really becoming, you know, just what's going on right now. This is what we were expecting, and that's what we were preparing for. So we talked about reporting illnesses and also um, the uh, presence of the isolation room in each of the schools in order to be able to offer um, containment if there was a case or symptoms that would occur during the school. So all this was already set into place in the framework and reviewed with the, with the entire school community on the very first day. So it, it's, it did send, it, it, it really did put down a nice groundwork. Um, and so with the other professional development that went on through the week, but when school started, we got to really operationalize all these plans and like Michael had said, we're really, really thrilled with the way uh, mask wearing, how well the kids have been wearing the masks, how well staff's been wearing the masks. We're very fortunate um, to have the PPE required in order to have enough as we, we were not sure about a burn rate, we're not sure how many masks we were gonna need, but we were able to provide every single staff person a face shield and if things happen to someone's mask, whether the ear loops break or it falls or gets contaminated, somehow breaks, we're able to offer those to any staff member or any student at any given time. So we have backup. Another thing that we did do over the summer with the recommendation from Charles Brown was all the nurses in the district attended a contact tracing course from John Hopkins University. This was a very intense course. It took many, many hours to complete, um, but it did provide a, a, a good solid um, baseline knowledge for contact tracing. In addition, we've created a contact tracing form that all the nurses have become familiar with and also the principals that we're starting to really use and we're very happy that we've had that already in place. And we use a surveillance tool for students and staff. Um, they monitor the attendance for students and staff every day. Uh, they complete a report, send it to me and their principals and sort of, and just, it's just a surveillance tool, just to see if there's any kind of trend, any kind of spike. Um, so we're able to really kind of pinpoint if we see any changes in our uh, absentee. In addition, there's a, a, a private COVID line um, that happens to be the school nurses line so that if parents must report or staff report a positive COVID case, it goes, it's a confidential line and it goes directly to the, to the school nurse in order for her to be able to document it in our confidential electronic health system. So um, again, we have every necessary precaution put into place and yes, we've had to, um, we've had to put it into practice and it worked quite well. Um, the, the things that we don't want to do is have transmission among schools in or within a school. So that is the beauty of the cohorts, especially at the elementary school level, but some at the middle school level, we know it's difficult at the high school level and we're not the only school district that's dealing with this. This is just, just the way it is. But with the contact tracing forms, which includes whether the people any kind of, if they're walkers, or if they're on a bus, what bus are they on? Do they have siblings in other schools? Do they have parents who work in other schools? There's many, many questions that are asked on this uh, contact tracing form. So we are able to complete the contact tracing form um, and then work collaboratively with Charles Brown, who our, a member of this uh, Central Connecticut Health District, to provide that information to them and get their guidance on who may need to be quarantined, who may need to be isolated. Um, and we, they really take the, they take the ship over from there, but we have all the information that they would need in order to perform, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> contact tracing. <clears throat> Hang on one second. <laughs> <laughs> So we've already we've also put in some information about different types of um, COVID testing sites. 
uh, Michael put out a communication, I believe it was last Friday or the Friday before, regarding protocols for staff and students. Uh, it's a four page document. Um, it's pretty detailed. It basically pulls apart addendum five from the Department of Education, the Department of Public Health on how to um, look at every single scenario, whether a person has, uh, has a positive COVID case, if that person um, has, is actually a member of our school community uh, and would need to be isolated, and who would there, therefore be close contacts. Now, when we had our professional development on August 23rd, I believe it was slide 17 was the definition of a close contact. And a close contact is someone who's been in um, within six feet, regardless of wearing a mask, with a positive COVID case greater than 15 minutes. And when we went over this particular slide, it seemed like just really no big deal. Well, this turns into, into be the big detail of containment and being able to perform um, good contact tracing in order to determine quarantining, isolation, or if really determining if there's a contact of a contact. So for instance, if you have a teacher who says that a family member of theirs that they live with has tested positive for COVID-19, that teacher would be a close contact. However, the classroom, before they knew that they had become a close contact, and so therefore they would, let's back up, they would quarantine for 14 days. But say they found out on Tuesday that their person in their family had tested positive, they would start their quarantine on that day. However, the students that that person had been in contact with are not considered close contacts. They are contacts of contacts. So therefore, because they have not been in contact with, or they were, Near, not near the positive COVID case. So those students would not need to quarantine because they are contacts of contacts. Um, so that is the really the point of contact tracing is looking at the true definition of a close contact, six feet for greater than 15 minutes. Um, if they've not met that requirement, then they are not considered a close contact. Let's say the teacher or, you know, or the person in a building you know, has to go on quarantine, you simply walk by them in the hallway, you are a contact of a contact and not a close contact. Every si single situation that we're going to be experiencing in the schools, and you know we're going to, will be looked at uh, uh, in an individual way. There's no cookie cutter, there's no absolute algorithm. Every We look at illness in the community which kind of makes things a little vague. And this is why I'm really happy that we have um, the addendum five, we have the protocols in place, but we also have other community illnesses that are circulating and we're gonna have the flu and I hope everybody gets their flu shot. Just plug in the flu shot, get it when you can. But um, we are, so that is, sometimes it's a vague decision where we have to really look at what's circulating in the community, what key symptoms, are being exhibited by a certain student or, or staff member. Key questions of have you been in contact with a positive COVID case or have you not been in contact? Sometimes we don't know the answer to that. Um, and also just the duration of symptoms. So it doesn't always qualify that we will, we will quarantine a student for 14 days or a staff member for 14 days. We hope that they would be able to seek medical attention to get a, an alternate uh, diagnosis or reason for an illness, but we can't always look at that either because that can be problematic. That can be very, you know, they don't have a doctor, they, they, they're inundated with being able to go see the doctor, but that's when we look at the expertise and the critical thinking skills of our school nurses um, and really looking at the whole picture. So, I believe we have things in place. Um, we're on our toes and I'm happy to answer any questions if people have any for me. Thank you, Ms. Dombrowski. Is there any board members with questions or comments? I have a question, please. Yes, yes. Mr. Cassio. Hi, Mr. Cassio. How are you, Claude? I'm Thank good. you so much. 
Thank you so much for everything that you're doing for the district and the little bit of education you just gave us right now. So just to, just to recap from what I'm hearing then, that is it a daily communication or weekly communication from the nurse or is the communication come from the principal to the staff on what's happening in their building? So we have, right now it's, we're looking, we have a very good level of wellness. So we're not providing like a daily report on how many students are sick with uh, symptoms. We do have an absentee, we have a daily absentee that the nurses do the surveillance on. Right now we have, you know, typical absenteeism um, among students and staff, but we don't have a daily. We're simply using our surveillance tool to look for any trends at this point. Okay. All right. So I was, so that would come from the nurse or the principal if it was something that needed to be reported. I would, I, I, we would definitely work. We do have responding teams, so we would work together and it, I most likely would come from an administrator. Thank you. You're welcome. John, to that point also, I just want to build on your, your question. The other piece that's clear here, if we do contact tracing and there is a uh, reason to believe that staff and other students had close contact and would need to quarantine, that would be administration and the Central Connecticut Health District that would reach out to those individuals that would need to quarantine. Thank you, Ms. Yeah. Evans. Hey, Claude, thank you so much for all this information. I sent Mr. Emmett an email with a ton of questions and he basically was like, save him for Claude because she's the expert. <laughs> um, no, but he answered a bunch of them too. Um, Lisa, where are you? <laughs> I just have, I just want to be clear because I feel like there is um, some confusion because it, I mean, you were talking and it confused me, not that you guys are experts. I believe there's a lot of wellness. I mean, I'm very impressed with the mask wearing. My first grader came home and I said, how is the mask? And she goes, oh, normal. Like there was no issue with it. It was amazing. Um, but I do have a question. So there's scenarios in which a student could have be COVID positive and their teacher would not have to quarantine. So I think that was the biggest question I have because this close contact um, you basically said was six feet for 15 minutes or longer. So if this student would, let's say there was a student in a classroom um, for a half hour, um, that teacher wouldn't necessarily have to quarantine if the student was positive or out of precaution, would the, student, would the teacher just naturally and anybody around that student would quarantine. So I guess I'm confused. So we would definitely use the guidelines of uh, close contact. If the student, and this might, be, thank goodness we haven't come up against many situations like this, but I'm envisioning with Charles Brown's guidance, he will be looking at the placement of the student in a classroom and the placement of the teacher. So that may negate the six feet. However, I, that would really be his, more of his determination. He's, he's, he's receiving a tremendous amount of uh, experience right now, looking at all our different school systems, Newington, Berlin, Rocky Hill, Wethersfield. So I would absolutely look to him to determine if he would think that the entire classroom, including the teacher, would need to be quarantined, or if that student was not within six feet of that teacher, if that would not um, really satisfy the um, close contact definition. Okay, um, then I guess I'll probably toss this over to Mr. Emmett. Um, I think that it's so specific. So it sounds like it's really case by case. So in terms of like where the child's sitting versus in the classroom versus, um, um, you know, where the teacher is and where the other student is um, really determines how close it is. Um, so it could be like, you know, some kid sits down for lunch and then the other kid sits in the place. So it, I guess that's all happening. I would suggest, I think that the teachers are a little bit confused as well as everybody, because we're all trying to figure this out. But I do think that maybe um, more communication. And I, I know that Mr. Emmett sent me some information, but I do think some of the teachers are frustrated because they don't know 
what's going to happen. There's a lot of these scenarios going through their heads. And um, I, I guess it's kind of tough. I would love to see some sort of opportunity for them to ask these questions. Like if this scenario happens, what, how should I be prepared? Because I worry about the anxiety in the classroom. Thank you for your information though. Okay. Kelly, I think that's a great point. I think it's important to reiterate that in each of our buildings, we have a nurse and I had suggested because I went over to Silas Dean last Thursday after I had sent the announcement out on um, that announcement went out. I know it went out to all of you, it went to you guys twice. It went out to all staff members in the district. It went out to all students and it went out to all parents. Um, I did follow up and, you know, I did hear some concern from some of the staff members. Um, one of the things I suggested to administration was at the next staff meeting, having Linda Ciarcia, our nurse, walk through the, the close contact, walk through the contact tracing. I mean, look, here's the reality. The communication that I sent out last Wednesday actually had addendum five in it. And what ended up happening was it's a link and you read the communication and you don't necessarily go into the link. So I definitely- I didn't. <laughs> that's, I, I definitely think, and that's, it's, it's a normal thing. You read the, the communication and that communication, so everyone knows, is a direct template from the Department of Public Health. Because I know the other piece is this, well, who is it? Who, what, what grade level? Well, what, what team? And I have to strike the balance and I had this conversation with the Weathersfield Federation of Teachers last Thursday. I have an obligation to maintain HIPAA guidelines as well as FERPA guidelines, and I have to be sensitive. One of the things I did is I sent out on Friday within the Stillman newsletter was the COVID stigma response. You know, somewhere here in this town of Wethersfield, we have uh, one of our school community members that has it and is probably mortified and embarrassed to see themselves up on the, or their story up on the media. So I really have to strike the balance of giving you as much information as I can with the idea of maintaining the privacy of the individual that is positive. So Kelly, to, to wrap up on your point, I think it's important from a, a follow-up standpoint to make sure that Linda speaks with the staff and answers any questions and concerns at the next staff meeting. Thank you for that. And my, my thought here is, I totally get it because if I had it, I would be a bit like, I don't, you shouldn't be embarrassed because it's a virus. You're not in virus right. the cold, but I totally get it. Um, what I would really like to see is just kind of a broader open communication with the teachers because I feel like I'm just worried about burnout. I'm worried about the amount that they're juggling in general doing this hybrid model. Then to have to worry about, okay, what's going to happen if I'm, they have an older mom and stuff like that. So what I'd really like to see is kind of um, just outreach, a little bit more communication, kind of back and forth saying, just so they can kind of get a little bit more comfortable with, if this happens, you know, what would be the situation? So I think that's just my, my big concern, but thank you. Thank you. Ms. Granato. No, and this is great because I can piggyback on what Kelly's saying. In the Stillman Weekly Letter, they talked about teaching teachers resilience. And I like to put the word anxiety in there. I think there's an awful lot of anxiety in the system. This is another criminal event. We had one with Sandy Hook, and now we're having one with this pandemic, in which the teachers are really unnerved. And I don't think you teach as well. I don't think you're as comfortable in your environment as when you are less anxious. Now, in this um, weekly letter, it was talking about wellness and social emotional learning. And I compliment the Hamner School, how proactive they were. They actually went out and are following a book and they're having a book club. And what a great way to discuss this anxiety because as it says, you can build resilience. Um, I think the system should be doing something similar like that. Um, we should all be in this together. And not knowing is scary. Um, being able to talk to one another builds resilience. And I think we need to do both of those. Thank you. Any other comments? Mr. Lesser. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a comment and a question. First, Chloe, thank you for all you're doing. It's an incredible um, amount of work and incredible effort and you're helping protect all of our uh, staff and teachers and students and we all appreciate you all throughout the district. So thank you very much. 
as far as my question to you, I wanted to ask you about absenteeism. So I know one of the guidelines is if a teacher feels uh, sick at all or a student is feels any type of um, illness at all, uh, we are telling them to stay home. Have we seen a significant increase in absenteeism either among staff or students? According to our surveillance data, we're looking at a normal absenteeism rate at this point, uh, around 3%. So it's, it's not a significant amount. That's through the week. That's for a total week. So we're looking at any kind of trends, but at this point, we're just looking at, um, we're not seeing any kind of increased absenteeism at this time. And that's for staff, right? Do we know about for students? Oh yes, we do a student. Yeah, we get daily absenteeism. Is it the um, same or similar? And, mm -hmm. Thank, yes. oh, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, same, okay. Well, yep. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I'm actually a little surprised, but I'm very happy to hear that. Yeah, I me too. I suspect in the fall it may, <laughs> In the fall and the weather changes, it may go up, but... Well, um, well, that's why we do the surveillance tool. So we can see if there's any significant trends or anything. We will be able to pinpoint it right away. Well, thank, thank you for everything you're doing. You're welcome. Sure. You're welcome. Any other questions or comments? All right. Thank you, Ms. Dombrowski, for coming tonight. I well, appreciate you're welcome. all your hard work. My pleasure. Anytime. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Next, announcements and information, please look in your packet. I know there is some committee meetings coming up. Make sure we, uh, if we can't attend, we let our chair of the committee know. Meetings held. Weatherfield Early Collaborative, which is the WEC, the WEC. It was on September 14th, 2020. Miss Granado. Okay, well, the WEC meeting, the Weatherfield Early Childhood Collaborative held a virtual meeting on Monday, September 14th. Kim Bobbin, who's the WEX coordinator, voiced her concern about the decline in the number of threes and four-year-olds attending preschool. The TLC, which is our town program, is not running right now due to low enrollment. So the town is exploring having a virtual preschool partnership with the Weathersville Public Schools to help our young citizens, our young learners, prepare for kindergarten. Um, this, and this is an important note, will be the focus of the WEC annual meeting, which is also virtual, on Monday, October 20th at 5.30. Please put it on your calendar. The meeting has the important topic of, quote, how do you meet the social and emotional and academic needs of children in a pandemic to ensure they are ready for kindergarten? Now, you'll have to check the WEC website for the link that will get you an invitation to that meeting. So um, everyone is invited and we all know that a strong early childhood learning experience is the strong foundation for a school system. These, um, please consider signing up for that meeting and um, it's just a very important meeting and not to have our preschool um, functioning is, is quite, um, upsetting thank you yes thank you miss granado next meeting held the correct council on 9 16 20 20 miss granado okay the correct council um met on wednesday september 16th in the, at the capital region educational council of which weathersfield's a member along with 35 other surrounding towns the council's responsible for all the regional magnet schools and for project choice. Greg Floria, the executive director's report was on the successful opening of the magnet schools and the challenges that CREC faces during this pandemic. Greg also spoke of the difficulties of food distribution, but that CREC was working to have remote learners able to participate as seamlessly as they operated it last spring for free breakfast and lunch programs. There was a discussion, now Zoom meetings come in handy when you're a group that's so separated from itself that some of the towns that are on the outer edges of the correct territory actually benefit from these Zoom meetings. It would make council meetings easier to attend instead of traveling to Hartford. 
and a report from Patrice McCarthy, who's the legal liaison for Creck and Cave to the state legislature is always interesting, but she did not have a lot to report for this meeting. She stated that all work is now being done under the governor's executive orders. There will likely be a special legislation soon with a limited agenda. The ending of the meeting was interesting as each town discussed their educational plan being implemented during this pandemic. The topic of concern for many schools is daycare for students during, during remote learning and childcare of educators' children. I'm sure this will be ongoing agenda topic during this whole school year. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Granato. Next meeting held, the Finance and Operations Committee meeting held before this meeting, 9-22-2020. Mr. Michaels. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a quick update. Uh, Mr. Kozaka reported that the auditors are wrapping up their work on the FY20 numbers. So we should have a audit confirmed uh, update on that coming shortly. Uh, as far as the FY21 forecast, we are currently under budget by almost $240,000, but I caution you that we are very early in the process and this is a very, this is a moving target uh, throughout the year. So uh, caution there um, as we enter yet another unprecedented school year ahead of us. Thank you, Mr. Michaels. Moving on, there is no meeting scheduled. There is no unfinished business. Public comment, Mr. Emmett, is there anyone on the phone for public comment? You're muted. Sorry, there, there is not, Mr. Carey. Sorry about Thank that. you, no problem. Board comment, anyone wishing to make board comment? I have a comment, please. Yes, Mr. Cassio. Thank you so much. Just wanted to thank everyone for all the work they're doing, not only as a board member, but also within our administration. But more importantly, I do want to thank the uh, faculty and staff of the Weathershield Board of Education. They're moving and they're working in unprecedented times. They're uh, keeping their enthusiasm up under uh, this pandemic again and not working with a certain calendar, so to speak. But more importantly, I just want to put the, a, a large thank you out to all of them um, and see, let them know that we do appreciate all the hard work they're doing. Now, with that being said, I would like to just bring some work to the table uh, that as a board, we've adopted a few years ago. And I asked the question of the superintendent, um, can you give the board a snapshot of how the leader leader model is currently working or is it just put to the side right now? No, it's a great question, Mr. Cassio. The leader leader model hasn't been put to the side at all. Um, it's obviously not focused with the Board of Education at this point in time. However, it is certainly focused with our building based leaders. Uh, Lyle Kurtman is still working with the leadership group of four principals. Um, and we are currently working on strategic planning. With regard to uh, working with teachers, this is the delicate balance that we currently have right now because what I heard just about 10 minutes ago was the amount of stress and anxiety that our teachers are faced with right now. I will say that our administrators, and uh, maybe Matt, Trent, and John can attest to this, our administrators are also facing a tremendous amount of stress and anxiety. So right now we're trying to find a balance, John, of making sure that we take care of the kids first. Um, we will certainly re-engage the leader leader work at the teacher level when things calm. I will say that at our buildings, we have leadership teams. So over the course of the summer with the reopening document, for example, Silas Dean Middle School, Highcrest School, I know Webb with Ken Craig just starting there and Hanmer. Uh, Charles Wright and Emerson, I've gone through them all, all have leadership teams in place and met over the course of the summer to talk about the, um, the reopening plan so that teachers had an input and had say in how this rolled out. Um, I think moving forward in the future, one of the things we're going to need to take a look at beyond just the leader leader is we're going to have to look at our strategic plan. 
and assess where it's at. I mean, let's face it, we started off the year, you know, typical and normal. And then by March, the middle part of March, everything changed. So we're going to have to revisit that as a board. We're going to have to talk as, as a board about where you want to head with that strategic plan, what needs to come off, what needs to be added, what needs to be adjusted. So with Leader Leader, it's still alive and well. Uh, it is certainly not in the forefront right now. It's about the social emotional learning and the well-being, health and safety of our students and staff. Um, Michael, can thank I add, you so much. Can I add something there, Michael? I mean, Chuck? Hold on. Elaine. John, are you done? Mr. No, I just wanted to, I just, I'm sorry, Elaine. Uh, I just want no to problem. say thank you, Michael. I just want to say thank you for the update, Michael. And I'm happy to hear that we are still allowing teachers input uh, during this time. I think that's key. And that's what they worked on so much to be able to be a part of the district and not be told what to do, right. to be a part of what the plan is. So thank you. I'm happy to hear that. I hope it is working and it is, is working in all our buildings. Thank you. Ms. Paradise. Thank you. Um, I was um, maybe a two hour teacher evaluation meeting yesterday with you, Chuck, and we heard from the teachers that they're doing a, a, a overload on work. They're in at 6.30 in the morning and it, it's still the high school people were there at five. Um, lessons, and technology, as Michael has said before, they're gonna be tweaks we need to do. And some lessons don't even get off because the internet goes blank or whatever. And these people have prepared this long lesson. So they have to stand on their feet and adjust at that moment. And I agree, John, that the leader, leader should be there. But right now, some of them sent me pictures of a person drowning as how they're feeling. and. Um, I just want to, you know, I support Mike in the sense that it is important that we can, and, and a lot of them shared that they're doing a lot of collaborative time because these could be on their goals. The fifth grade teachers are meeting together to come up with similar plans or similar computer skills or whatever they're teaching. So a lot of, um, shall we call minor leader leaders are going on in, in their classrooms, right? Mike, well, she, well you weren't there, yes, I'm sorry, but they were sharing so much stuff together. The curriculum specialists are in there helping them share materials for new kids that are new teachers. The veterans are helping. I mean, I guess I kind of put that under leader, leader, helping each other in these times. Now, John, I agree with you. We could go back to full leader, leader when this kind of settles down, but they have enough to do from what I heard yesterday. And they're in not as directly as we, we wanted leader, leader, but they're still helping and, and doing things together and sharing. And I think that's commendable to all of them who are, who are just about to start and the internet shuts down. You know, the poor art teacher, she goes, I've had to stand on my feet and um, do something else right then and there, you know? So imagine that people um, in, in your life with 15 kids in front of you and they're, you know, what do you, it's tough very tough for them and they're very anxious but they're doing it that's the point she came up with something else but she's got experience what about the first year teacher and they're go willing to go next door and help the first year teacher so i commend them all my john and i know you do too but um i don't think leader leaders at their top of their game right now <laughs> they're surviving day by day <laughs> sorry that's all i had to add because i saw them all yesterday thank you miss paradise miss granado um, I had two other meetings I wanted to bring up. One was Keen on Kids. Um, Judy Keen is so disappointed, but um, Keen on Kids met virtually on Thursday, September 17th. And like most nonprofits in this area, they've had to cancel events for this year because of the risk of infection from the coronavirus and the need for social distancing. So their golf outing is out, their 5K walk and run, their picnic of remembrance on the green and their Cove side carnival. That's a lot of money folks. Canine Kids After School in Richmond did have a four week program that focused on summer science. But this fall with the changes in the school with hybrid and virtual learning and the safety regulations, they will not have in-person keen on kids after school enrichment programs. They are looking to find a virtual enrichment program possibly on Wednesday, but they're, they're, they're searching for that. Um, another group, 
and it, it, it gets a little frightening. There was the Wesleyville Hunger Action Team virtual meeting on Friday, September 18th. Sarah Hill is our coordinator. The farmer's market is now taking SNAP money. The dazzling dozen monthly food drives continue. Women for Progress did September with an abundance of food. This food goes to the food bank in the month of October, set to be run by the Wethersville Democratic Town Committee. The Wethersville Public School and Chartwell's Dining are pleased to offer free breakfast and lunch for all Wethersville kids eight, age 18 and under. The service is available to all students, whether present in a school or learning from home. An online order form must be completed prior to the pickup at Wethersville High School from 1030 to 12. And the flyer hat with um, all the available information comes to the schools. Um, food share is at Rentschler Field, the rent as it's called. And last Tuesday, so a week ago today, had 2,200 cars come through. And that just shows you the demand continues to grow as many individuals and families in our area are dealing with food insecurities. There was a discussion of free pantries located around town um, and the planning has started for food help for the holidays, especially for Thanksgiving. This is an incredibly dedicated group to work with. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Granato. Any other comments? Ms. Evans. Thank you, Mr. Carey. I have one um, comment kind of slash question um, regarding professional development and um, is uh, there's all this new stuff with Google Meets and all these new items and <laughs> I, I honestly, I'm not, I could barely even log on to this. So in terms of professional, uh, professional development this year, are we, are we gonna kind of like streamline um, to some of this new stuff um, to help the teachers do more with all these varying platforms? Yeah, good, good question. And it's interesting, Kelly, you know, I learned all about uh, meat crashers. I had never heard of meat crashers. Before. I just read an article. About yeah. that. We had meat crashers in Weathersfield where we had students giving out their, uh, their uh, IDs to get into a meeting to someone else and they joined by a phone and can't be identified. So um, we're, we're learning as we go. Um, we are in the process of developing the uh, PD schedules for uh, upcoming dates. Uh, obviously, as you know, uh, we have uh, election day, there's PD that day, and I believe there's a PD day in October as well. So th that type of PD, we do gauge uh, what our teachers need. I am certain that there will be some technology offerings. The other thing we've done too with uh, Sarah Harris is our instructional uh, supervisor for technology. Um, one of the things we found like at Highcrest School, um, the planning process, you know, one of the things we heard from teachers was, you know, it's like I'm planning for three groups. I got my cohort in front of me. I got the kids that are in cohort two, and then I've got the remote learners. So Sarah reached out to them and met with them and talked about ways to um, kind of increase the efficiency. The other thing that's the reality with our teachers, they, they, they want to do their best. They, they, they want perfection. And the reality in this particular environment with the unknowns of the internet, today I had a Zoom meeting with a group of area superintendents and Lyle Kurtman. Our network went down and I got booted <laughs> from the call. The, these things happen and you know we have to, we, we have to be able to be adaptive to, to these new environments. The other thing I wanna to stress too with regard to PD, I said it before with uh, John's comment, I, I certainly don't wanna overdo it and I don't want professional development to be just a you know four hour block of time where nothing meaningful gets done. It needs to be meaningful, it needs to be sustainable and it needs to be applicable. So we're in the process of developing those. We have draft uh, documents once we have this set PD schedule, we'll make sure that we get that out to you guys so that the full board sees it in advance. Thank you so much. And I will just reiterate, I mean, I'm beyond 
floored with how organized. I know I sent you a note after the first week of school, this um, hybrid model is working. I mean, the fourth grader, I was like, oh, this is gonna be easy. The, the fact that my first grader can log on and knows more than I do, <laughs> and they keep them on track in the schedule. I mean, it, it, they've modified it to make it even better, but it's beyond impressive. And I mean, these teachers are really doing a fantastic job. So and thank you. This, that piece right there, to, to build on what you just said, is why we need to continue to think about being innovative. Think about where we were. I, I didn't know how to do a Google Meet. I couldn't do a Zoom Meet. I, I, I didn't know anything about these platforms. These platforms have become so part of our fabric right now. When this pandemic is over, I think ahead to how do we leverage the amount of experience that these kids now have with these models? How do we take learning outside the classroom? How do we bring others? And I think I'm going back to our strategic plan bringing others from outside back into the district. We have a tremendous ability down the road here to change how we do business. So I think it's gonna be important once we get to that point where we've got a vaccine and we're moving in that direction where we can get back to this level of normalcy. Let, I'm looking forward, I'm excited. I mean, yes, I'm nervous and I'm anxious, but I'm also excited about what the future holds. Our teachers have done tremendous work and so have our kids. It's incredible. That clever app, that little thing you put in front of the camera and it opens everything up and then they can go on and it's really, I don't even know how to explain it intelligently, but <laughs> my first year, my first grader could do it. No problem. And it's, it's impressive. So thank you. Thank you. Mr. Riley, you had a comment? Uh, yes, I did. I wanted to thank the uh, administrators and all the teachers for the great job that they're doing. And I just had a a comment in regards to what the Bobby was saying about uh, enrollment in preschool. I mean, we have a four-year-old and we thought about preschool, but we thought if something happens there, then she'll be, she'll be back at, at home. And if we lose a, a daycare spot, um, then we'd have her at home. And so uh, we decided not to, not to do that. And I think the issue is a, a four-year-old at home is very challenging uh, when you're trying to work as well. Thank you. Any other board comments? All right, I just want to say I want to thank the high school, middle school, and Charles Ray where my three kids go. I thought it was very innovative, our virtual open house. It was great. Um, Mr. Moore did a great job organizing all the links so people could get around to all the different classes. Same thing at the middle school and same thing with Mr. Um, Porter. So I appreciate the innova innovativeness of all the teachers and administrators to get those virtual houses going. I also want to thank the staff of our district. They're doing a great job. Remember the forefront is keeping everyone healthy and safe. And with that, I know, I know it's been a big burden on the parents of our district with the hybrid model, but know that it's on the forefront of Mr. Emmett's decision making of what's safest and healthiest for our students and staff. And that's always gonna be the center of his decision making. So, but we do appreciate your patience and help in this unprecedented time of education. But we do realize it is a burden on a lot of people and certainly not easy. Seeing no other comment, can I get a motion to move into executive session? So moved. Can I get a second? A second. Thank you. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? Motion passes. Let's give it a minute for our recording to end. Good night, everyone.